Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar Conscious Inclusion Moving on from Unconscious Bias. My name is Biliana and I'm the project admin officer at the Center for Cultural Diversity in Aging. The center's vision is that we want all aged care consumers in Australia to receive inclusive and accessible care. And um, our purpose is that uh, the aged care providers will be able to deliver welcoming and accessible and inclusive care to their aged care um, recipients. And our service areas um, are training and workshops such as this one, um, capacity and building to promote cultural inclusion and equity, uh, which we do through our multi uh, multilingual resources and diversity advice and consulting, which we do on an individual basis for the government and for aged care providers. And uh, of course, I'd, um, I'd like to mention that um, the Center for Cultural Diversity in Aging is supported by Benetus and funded by uh, the Department of Health. And uh, that is through the Partners in Culturally Appropriate Care PCAC program. Today, we'll cover uh, presentation of unconscious inclusion, moving on from unconscious bias with Betty um, Otho. Uh, she is co-founder of DeepTel and Lorna Deng. She's also part of DeepTel. And uh, after that, we'll follow up with a Q&A session uh, with our manager, Lisa Tribusio. And uh, Nikki will talk about uh, where to go to uh, find um, support on our website. I have the pleasure of introducing two wonderful ladies who will present today for you. Uh, one is Betty Othello. Betty is a passionate human resource professional with over 10 years experience within the legal and public sectors. She is involved in numerous diversity and inclusion committees and is a strong advocate for inclusion within the work workplace. She's also the proud co-founder of DeepTel, and uh, that is an online job platform that connects employers to job candidates uh, from underrepresented minority backgrounds. In 2021, she is appointed uh, the principal advisor uh, for people and culture at the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission. And the other presenter for today is Lona Deng. Uh, Lona is a co-founder one of the co-founders of DeepTel, and she is named, uh, uh, she was recently named by the uh, Smart Company as one of the Australia's 13 most inspiring female entrepreneurs, and her purpose is to help uh, create more inclusive uh, future of work. She is a speaker and member of various diversity and inclusion committees. Welcome, uh, Betty and Lona, and the floor is yours. Welcome everyone to the Moving Away from Unconscious Bias to Conscious Inclusion session. Um, I'm Betty. And I'm Lorna. Yes, mm -hmm. and we're super excited to take you through our presentation today. Um, you know, we won't go too much into who we are because we've already had such a lovely intro. Um, but we did want to start the session by saying that we want it to be an interactive session as much as a virtual session can be. We will have a few engagement activities throughout, yes. um, and we really encourage you then to, <laughs> to participate um, as much as you can as well, um, just so we can you know, get a, an idea. We want this to be tailored to you, so we want to make sure we're covering the right content. Today, what we really want to cover and the key outcomes we want to get out of today is um, number one, our understanding of the business case for diversity, in particular, the business case for diversity for the aged care sector. Um, and then we want to dive a little bit deeper into defining and understanding identity, intersectionality and privilege. Um, and then we want to move on to just, you know, highly, um, a, a high level cover of what is unconscious bias, because um, as you can tell by the name of our session, we really are about conscious inclusion and want to move away from unconscious um, bias as the, as the overall topic. And also we know that you've probably attended quite a few unconscious bias sessions. Um, so we will cover that at a high level. Uh, and then we will get to the our favorite part, which is really 
understanding how to be more consciously inclusive, really having that mindset shift of conscious inclusion and describing what that is um, in the first place and seeing and um, through examples how you can uh, really activate that in the workplace. So let's start with kind of setting the scene. When we set the scene around what the business case for diversity and inclusion is, specifically in the aged care, um, we like to think about the meanings of diversity. So what is the meaning of diversity? Diversity essentially tells us that we are all different um, and we have, uh, you know, in terms of cultural background, age, um, we'll talk about intersectionality later, but essentially diversity, the meaning of diversity is recognizing that we're all different. And then when we think about the word inclusion, um, inclusion is actually doing something about the fact that we're all different and acknowledging that and more, more importantly, removing any bias towards how we all see each other differently. So um, I really wanted to start by defining what that is. But how does that play into the business case for the, um, for the aged care sector? So we know all you got to do is walk around <laughs> Australia in um, probably in specifically certain areas. But if you walk around Australia, you can quite easily see that Australia is becoming a more multicultural um, in, uh, environment. So we know that Australia is becoming very multicultural. We also know, and, you put, and in terms of the aged care sector, that um, it is all, you can already start seeing your clients um, number one, the people who work within the aged care sector are also very diverse. Um, but we are now starting to see that come into your um, into the clients who are coming in and using um, probably a lot of your services. Um, and I know some of you are tailored to um, uh, people from uh, different minority backgrounds. So you, you, I think we all are across that. So when we think about where the aged care system is heading, we know that um, just based on the research we've done, and are you speaking to Lisa, um, we know that there is also um, an increased choice and control for clients um, system that needs to be utilized in the aged care system. And we're very much interested in this person-centered care. And with this person-centered care, diversity plays a huge part. Um, and understanding that everyone's different and has different specific needs um, is a very important element of that. So uh, that is another very important element. But I think for me, the element that really matters is it's just the right thing to do. <laughs> if you don't pick up on the importance of diversity and more importantly, inclusion in understanding people are different and being inclusive of what their needs are, you will fall behind. So I think the aged care system really in the way the clients are going, everything that we know about where we're heading, if we don't, if the uh, industry does not pick up on it, it will fall behind. Um, so it's just the right thing to do. And I think that's kind of uh, the main thing we want to chat about when we think about setting the scene. Wonderful. Thank you, Betty. Um, so what I'll do now is just do a bit of a deep dive around identity, um, intersectionality and, and privilege and just really um, deep dive into what that means. And, and so if you think of identity, you know, so we are all made of uh, various identities in, in sociology, it's defined. So identity is how we define ourselves. Um, it's also about how we see the world around us, um, but also how we see ourselves in relation to the world around us. So, you know, some identities are things that we can easily see, you know, such as race or assumed gender, um, you know, whilst others are not always, you know, visible, you know, such as disability. Um, so it's important for us to, you know, understand identi identity and, and be clear that it's it's about how an individual identifies. Um, so we should not always assume identity. So the diversity and inclusion conversation, you know, has typically traditionally focused on you know, segmented groups. And currently, you know, there's, there's been a, a greater focus around understanding how different identity constructs um, interlay and, and interact with each other. And so the Oxford Dictionary defines intersectionality as, so the interconnected nature of social categorization, such as race, uh, gender, class, regarding um, as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination or disadvantage. So, 
So going back to the point around, it's, it's, it's ever so critical to understand how these different constructs interplay with each other because, you know, as a female or as a male, you know, you will have a very different experience depending on your you know, sexuality or your nationality or your racial identity. And so to, to move on to the concept around privilege. So privilege, it's about having a special right, um, a, an advantage or immunity granted to yourself or a group. Um, it's, it's about understanding that, you know, certain social groups, you know, may by birth or acquisition have, you know, knowingly or unknowingly can, can reap unfair benefits or advantages over other members of society. And so typically, you know, the dominant group will have power, you know, they can define, um, you know, name reality, determine what's normal, you know, real and correct. And whereas, if, whereas, um, and also kind of differential and unequal treatment, you know, can be institutionalized and and system and systemic. So, it's important for us when we're having this holistic DNI diversity and inclusion conversation to really understand identity, the overlays of intersectionality, and and power and privilege and and how that all fits together. Yeah. And I think it's really important to understand that we all have privilege. And I think people usually are like gobsmacked when I say, well, I even have privilege as, um, you know, yes, I, I am. A, I have a lot of, <laughs> I've gone through a lot of barriers growing up in Australia, being a South Sudanese um, woman and um, coming to Australia at, at a time when African migration had just started. So um, best believe I was always the only South Sudanese woman everywhere. And I think Lorna has had some very similar experience. Yeah. Mm. So, but even in saying that, I also understand that um, I've had the privilege of being a, able to grow up here, um, go to school, uh, go up, uh, go to school and also come from a middle class. So um, kind of uh, setting afterwards. So in meeting other people, not always assuming that everyone has, just because they're a migrant like me, maybe they have, haven't had a two-parent household, maybe they grew up in foster care. Mm -hmm. And these and this is how intersectionality plays a part. Um, depending on your experiences, who you are, um, it can mean that you have a privilege over other um, people and recognizing that and not making assumptions is a really important part of to play in that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Betty. So what we'll do now is we'll deep dive into unconscious bias. But before we do that, um, so we wanted to ask a question. So there's a scenario here where a father and his son are in a car accident. The father dies at the scene, you know, and the son is badly injured, is rushed to the hospital. So in the operating room, the surgeon refuses to operate, saying, I can't operate on this boy. He is my son. So in this scenario, who is the surgeon? So feel free to... Feel free to put your comments in the in the chat. Perfect. I can see a few comments coming in. So his mother, his mother, perfect. Great. Yeah. His other father, great, great. Yeah, perfect, great. So the reason we wanted to you know, put this out there, sometimes people are often puzzled, you know, with this response, response. And um, yeah, but the answer is certainly, you know, it can be parent, it can be mother. Um, if it's in a same-sex marriage, could be the father. But sometimes, in, a, in many scenarios, you know, our unconscious bias, you know, may mean that you know it takes a couple of minutes to really think about who this person could be, um, and and we don't always you know, associate the surgeon as a woman. So it's great that a lot of you got that correct. But yeah, so we'll kind of continue to deep dive into, you know, this concept of uh, unconscious bias. Yes, we're loving that there's a lot of consciously inclusive people here. Mm -hmm. um, we knew that it, it, it definitely um, was the mother. And I, I think um, if we ran that a couple of years ago, it would probably not be the same. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's mm -hmm. good to see. Absolutely. So perfect. So we will deep dive oh, into. That's great, Stephanie. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, Stephanie's just said that when she did come across that scenario um, a few years ago, it did take her uh, a while um, to figure it out. So no, thank you for sharing that. We love that because I I had the same <laughs> I had the same experience as well. It wasn't yes. that instant. Um, and this is what it's all about. It's all about growth. Um, learning and unlearning. So thank you for sharing, Stephanie. There we go. Perfect. So 
I'll hand that over to you. Thank you. So um, now we want to look briefly into unconscious bias. So um, I, I, um, Lorna's like, we have to go through the unconscious bias. I'm like, <laughs> let's move to conscious inclusion. So, but it's very important that we understand what is unconscious bias um, and what are unconscious biases. Um, so they are thoughts and feelings that we all have and we may not be aware of, but what is the most element, um, most important element is that it does influence um, our judgment and the way we think and the way um, we first come across something, our unconscious bias will quickly go, oh, this person is probably A, B, C, D. Um, and it takes a second to stop, um, really be more conscious of what those thoughts are and um, unravel them a lot more um, to move away from that instant unconscious bias. But the one thing we can take um, and the knowledge that we have is that we all have it. Um, and I think when we talk about unconscious bias, we realize, well, you know, so many unconscious bias training, um, talking about the way it works as opposed to the way that we can kind of do something about it. Mm. Um, so it's really important about acknowledging that it's there, acknowledging that um, it's that element of we're not aware of it. I think we are aware of it. I would actually question that. I know the meaning there says we're not aware of it. I'd say we, we've come to a point that I think a lot of us are aware of unconscious biases. It's about the people who are stopping and really looking into them a lot deeper um, that are moving towards that more conscious, inclusive side, which we'll go through. Mm -hmm. But yes, they are unavoidable. It's human nature. So um, no one can walk around saying, no, I don't have any biases. Um, they, they, they'd be doing a lot of active thinking and really um, um, going against the way their brain works. But um, it does make sense to stop and think about um, unconscious biases and being aware of them is the number one element. Absolutely. So if we think of, and to follow on to your point, Betty, so we, we know that if you think of unconscious bias, it's, it's like an iceberg. And I'm sure many of you have come across this diagram, but, you know, at the bottom, it's about, you know, the, which is, which represents the majority of kind of our, our mind. It's about the, the deep hidden part around our attitudes, um, beliefs, assumptions. And these are really influenced about, you know, our early experiences in life, you know, family, peers, you know, religion. And then they impact, you know, how we behave in certain scenarios and, and what is observable. So at the bottom, it's really around that represents that unconscious bias or the unconscious mind, which impacts kind of our, our conscious um, uh, at the top. So to go on to a little bit about our common biases. Yes, thanks, Lona. And I think that iceberg just allows you to just, you know, based on just talking about unconscious bias, it just gives you that picture to really understand all the kind of the important elements are all at the bottom of the iceberg and um, and the importance of being able to understand that. What does, sorry, was, uh, I think we've got a question. What does court mean in the iceberg? We can go back to the iceberg. You said court subconscious. Oh, okay. So essentially the, the court element means, um, so elements in life. So if you think of your earlier experiences, your, your peers, potentially even things like media, so things that you've inherited or you've um, been exposed to. So things like you've sort of- You've caught yeah, it along the way. <laughs> yeah, essentially. Yeah. So I think it's, it's trying to, and, and the you know word court, the reason why it's there, it's, it's, it rhymes with taught. So yeah, but essentially it's what you've picked up in life, what you've um, um, inherited and, and, and that impacts kind of what you've, um, you know, the observable elements of, of your conscious mind. Learned behavior. Yeah. Yes. Very correct. <laughs> so um, we'll quickly cover some common bias um, types. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of bias types. Um, it wouldn't fit in one slide. Um, um, but these, this is essentially, you know, some of the bias types that uh, we tend to see come out in the workplaces. Um, the first one is affinity bias. Um, so that's the preference, um, having a preference of people who have shared qualities who are similar, that are similar um, to your shared qualities. So, um, you know, meeting somebody and going, yep, you know, they, 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 uh, they love the same things as me. They grew up in the same place. They must be amazing, <laughs> essentially, yep. 
And we we all have that. Who doesn't love somebody who you can connect with with so many different ways? But it does mean we could miss out on people who, for whatever reason, um, I, I don't have the same shared qualities um, based on many different reasons, um, where they grew up, uh, the privileges that they may have not had, et cetera. Um, there's also confirmation bias, um, and that's the tendency of selective observation, um, whereby you search for evidence that blocks, that backs up your opinion and overlook or reject information that may contradict that. Um, and I think that's a really interesting one. I think that's a very much um, where unconscious bias is highlighted through confirmation bias, um, bias where your brain um, just automatic um, and it, it essentially contradicts sometimes your own opinion. You're like, no, that must be wrong, essentially. Um, there's also conformity bias um, when your views are influenced or changed by the views of others. Um, and if those others are, again, those people from good old affinity bias um, with shared experiences and qualities and everything that um, essentially represents you, um, conformity bias can become very quick. You know, you all have very similar opinions as well. Um, and there's also the halo effect, um, the way you think or feel about a person being shaped by one characteristic. That could be a positive or a negative characteristic. So it could be that, yep, I'm associating this person with a positive one. It's usually, um, I think, with halo effect, it has to do with the person's appearance. Mm. So we've got to remember a lot of these are common bias types that are come out of un unconscious bias. So they're happening right at the beginning. Um, so halo effect tends to be more associated with the, uh, the, like just looking at someone's appearance and it could be a positive one. That person is beautiful, so they must be great. Or that person is, um, you know, different. So I think actually they may not fit in. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of um, unconscious bias in the workplace, um, which we can all relate to because we've all, I think that's the one thing we all have in common here. We've all worked in different workplaces. Um, and we find that unconscious bias probably comes up the most in workplaces. Um, it's the predominant environment that it comes up the most in. Um, and it, it, you can see it happening with your interactions with colleagues, customers, patients, even family members. Um, and they can be positive or negative. And if we go back to the common bias types, they could be positive because you've only associated um, a positive behavior based on your experiences. But they could also be negative based on even not your experiences, but just based on what you've seen in um, now with the social media life, they could bring up a lot of stereotypes. Um, and it can also come up, um, and this is an area that Lorna and I um, have witnessed, and it's probably the reason we created DivTel. <laughs> um, it also comes up in um, our organizational practices, processes, and policies. Um, and uh, that is HR policies, uh, promotions, um, recruitment is a very, very, very big one. And it's the reason why we said we want to create DivTel because we recognize that a lot of these biases are happening um, and they are stopping um, a lot of diverse talent from coming through. Um, and it's taking away things like lived experience and things that you can't catch just by seeing someone. Um, and the bias, the unconscious bias has taken over a lot of these processes. And you can also see them just the organizational culture. Um, the, you know, the good old, let's go to a pub for a beer. Um, and what does that mean for somebody who doesn't drink? Or, you know, there's a lot of organizational cultures that have been formed by conformity bias yeah. um, and having people with shared experiences and not even really being able to differentiate that with um, people who may not uh, necessarily um, follow the same practices. Uh, please start thinking about your, oh, yeah, thank you. I thought that was a question. So yes, I agree. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, please definitely start thinking about your questions as we get through the presentation. So we have an activity for you. Um, we thought it would be quite uh, useful to start looking and just being very clear about how we can spot unconscious biases. Um, and again, that's just based on looking at someone. Um, and we have a few scenarios um, and people attached to those scenarios. 
um, and would love again the chat um, for you to share with us some what are some of the bias um, that can come up for this um, for these individuals in this in these situations. So we're looking at this individual. Um, we're looking to hire a direct care worker, um, and we've now come across this individual straight away in an interview process. What are some bias? Um, what are some biases can, that can come up for this individual? Just in that blanket statement, tattoos, yep. Yeah. Appearance, yep. Yeah. Rings, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Body language. It's a bias against men as carers. Yeah, um, interesting. Men not nurturing. Mm -hmm. Religion. Mm -hmm. How can a man provide care? Yeah. No, this is this is excellent. So definitely, yeah, yeah. We see a lot of implicit biases in this based on appearance and stereotypes of males with tattoos. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, we also, you know, one that does come up quite a lot is age bias. Um, you know, he seems young and trying to just have a great time. Why would he want to work here? Mm -hmm. So questioning somebody's motivation mm -hmm. would come up. Um, and also very much things like um, affinity bias, which is um, also around the unconscious preference of people <laughs> who share similar qualities. You may be like, am I meant to relate to this individual? We understand the aged care sector is one that is um, uh, predominantly, um, you know, women, female um, working there. So it could be really hard to understand how you would be able to relate to this person and may question their motivation. Okay, great. So really good. Yeah. Responses. Yeah, no. Fantastic. All right. So we will move on to the next individual. So this is about, so if you're looking to hire an aged care director, you know, what are some of the biases that could come up when um, considering this candidate to, yeah, to be a director? Okay. There's, there's a lot of comments around age. A lot of age yeah. bias straight yeah, from the get go. It's around to hairdo. Yep. Hair. Mm -hmm. Too young to have experience. Yeah. Lots of comments around hair and, and youth. Yeah. Dress doesn't appear suitable. Mm. Okay. Yes. Yep. Clients don't like a person of color as a director, you know, age, appearance, ethnicity. You know, will she fit in ethnicity? Fantastic. Excellent. Gender. Too pretty to be clever. Oh, yeah, very true. Exactly. This is where the positive, <laughs> you know, um, association that, you know, beautiful people, why would they want to come <laughs> do this particular job? Mm -hmm. No, very interesting. Yeah. It's great. Okay. And we'll go to the, the final person. So, so providing care to this client, you know, what, what would some of the biases be? around providing care to this client. Too old. Okay, mm -hmm. ageism. Age and ability, unable to lift, too fragile. Too old, ethnicity, not dressing professionally, communication barriers, language barriers. Yeah. Won't understand. Yeah, yeah. And I think this one's a quite an important one because I think it's is very much related to taking care of um, clients who mm. uh, come from culturally linguistically diverse backgrounds, and just the assumptions around, um, you know, being from a non-English speaking uh, background, mm. and essentially um, how you treat that person mm. and um, the frustrations that may lie in, treat in treating that person because there could be communication barriers, as you said. Um, uh, and a lot of assumptions about their ability to understand. So we really wanted to highlight this as, you know, it's not, it's definitely about internally, um, you know, the people who work, the employees um, and the diversity of employees. And, you know, I wanted to highlight with the one um, just before, you know, um, could she have been an internal candidate? Do we look at internal candidates as ways to progress um, and, and consider them in progression? Why not when they are the ones who um, are very much the talent pipe, pipeline coming through? 
Um, and also, you know, those things like too young, all of that are the reasons why um, probably some of the internal candidates may not even ever apply, right? Mm -hmm. So very mm -hmm. much alive and one that they know of. And the same with, uh, with clients. Um, um, this particular client may have a lot of assumptions mm -hmm. when this is probably the client that has come all the way from their country mm -hmm. um, and has uh, raised uh, their son, daughter, whoever you're communicating with, who has this excellent English speaking and has this amazing life, that is the product of that amazing life. So really being conscious mm. of lived experience and not ever making assumptions. Absolutely. That's a great point. So, and, and thank you all for your honesty. And this is what it's about. It's about us having these types of conversations and, and being honest about, you know, what we are seeing, you know, what are some of the assumptions we make around people and, and, you know, how that interplays when we interact with individuals. So maybe we just want to maybe spend a couple of minutes. And if you have, you know, if you've been one of the people that have responded and, and put in the chat, some of your initial reactions when, seeing the, the, these candidates or clients, maybe just pause and think about, you know, what are some of those cultural rules and values and, and behaviours that you learnt, you know, growing up that have influenced how you responded um, in the chat in the chat today and, you know, and how have these shaped you? So I think and when it comes to unconscious bias, you know, while it's, it's very much unconscious and it's not something that we, it's always front of mind, the more that we can, um, appreciate or just be aware that they, you know, they impact our day-to-day -day behavior and interactions. Um, that that's the start around this uh, unconscious bias piece. Okay, so so thank you very much for your kind of yeah. There's been a lot of amazing honesty, and it starts with honesty, um, mm. and that's how you move towards conscious inclusion, which is a perfect segue. My favorite part of everybody. <laughs> Um, after knowing and recognizing unconscious um, biases and understanding, you're kind of like, what's next? What can I do about it? And this is where Lorna and I um, and what we do at Diftal is really discuss conscious inclusion. Um, when we talk about conscious inclusion, it is moving towards being more consciously inclusive of those biases um, and understanding that it's about valuing people's difference and people's backgrounds, everything. Actually, it's about flipping it all around. All mm -hmm. the things that you have been taught or have learned along the way about difference and um, disassociating with certain elements. Mm -hmm. It's about actually flipping that around and going, no, I'm curious. I want to understand. I, um, I want to move away from assumption. I want to move towards understanding and being more consciously inclusive about where my current understanding is and being really excited about where you can get to. Um, and that is what conscious inclusion is all about. It's about a mindset shift. You're essentially unlearning and, um, and moving towards everything you've been told to do, <laughs> uh, moving away from that and being a lot more, um, uh, I'd say purposeful about how you do things. So um, we want to quickly also go through, you know, really important elements um, when we talk uh, before we move a little bit more towards conscious inclusion. Um, in terms of prejudice, stereotypes, and microaggressions, um, it's it's really important to understand these three elements um, in the way, and I think they're the products of what happens mm -hmm. um, when un unconscious bias takes over. Um, you know, prejudice is strong feelings and beliefs about a person or a subject uh, and, um, and uh, others without reviewing facts or information, often based on fear. Fear is the biggest driver mm -hmm. of many things. And we know that um, social media loves a good fear story. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's probably the, I don't know if they come around um, in uh, like a meeting and they're like, so what fear are we playing on today? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, also stereotypes. Um, the assumption that everyone in particular groups is the same. Again, purely based on what you've seen and heard, but never based on what who you've interacted with. Mm -hmm. That's how stereotypes come to life. Um, and also, uh, microaggressions um microaggressions i think are very very much alive in a lot of our workplaces um i think it comes from the conformity culture that we have here um in australia where people don't ever really um say 
um, what they want to say, but they do it through microaggressions. Um, very su subtle, um, you know, uh, way that you will recognize, but it'll kind of, that person won't essentially recognize it straight away. I know I've been attributed to quite a lot of microaggressions where I get home and I was like, wait a minute. Um, you know, some examples of microaggressions that I have come across are things like, wow, that's a big role. Mm. You know, and we'll go through a little bit more about what some of those examples are now, actually. Um, so here are some of the examples just based on prejudice, stereotypes and microaggressions. Um, and we wanted to share this with you, with you because we want you to recognize what you may have come across, um, but also what you may not have been actively a part of or may have heard, but never ever associated with it being wrong or incorrect or knowing it's incorrect but feeling you can't do or say anything about it mm. right so some of these examples um could be from themes such as people who look different to the majority or are named differently to the majority and are assumed to be foreign so you know they get a lot of these mm. but where are you really from um i've had that so many times and i think lona yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> it's just it's the fact that you know you respond and say you know say where you're from and you know you might you might have been australian you might have been born in australia and you know you might look physically different but to have the question come up and and essentially your initial response around, you know, I'm from here, I'm from, you know, might be from, you know, Fitzroy. Yeah, you know, to have that yeah, kind of denied yeah. sometimes is, yeah, it, it, the, the key message here is, is when it's about to say, it's, it's around, you're not Australian, you know, it, because you don't look like the majority Correct. or you're a foreigner in your own country. Correct. And I think it goes back to um, what you discussed around identity. Mm. Um, I think it's really important to understand people get to pick their identity. Yes. So if I say mm. I'm Australian, I'm Australian. <laughs> um, and I think it's, um, you know, uh, very much something that keeps coming up. Mm. And I think people are just trying to say, uh, calling out, yes, you're different, but, you know, you should always just ask, mm. you know, and go by how somebody identifies themselves. Um, another theme that um, we'll look at is assigning competence um, or not based on English literacy levels. So I think um, aligning intelligence to the English language is mind boggling. <laughs> <laughs> so you're essentially saying because you do not know how to speak English, um, you can not possibly be intelligent. Like English is the only language on this whole earth. Um, so there's, that happens all the time as well. When you find that somebody may have an accent or has English as a second language, um, we tend to feel that there is a lot of assumptions made mm -hmm. about them being essentially incompetent um, and not maybe fitting in or assimilating to the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. So we'll move on now. So there's a, a few phrases that we've just put up here. Um, and and if these are phrases that, you know, the day-to-day -day person, you know, we use in our day-to-day -day life and, you know, sometimes may not seem as, as incorrect. So, wow, you don't look 65. You know, that's, in, that's you know, demonstrating our, you know, ageism, you know. The fact that we have gender, gendered language when it comes to certain, um, you know, certain professions, firemen, policemen, we still use use those terms and it's very commonly used, things like, Hi guys, we have that yeah. know, meetings, <laughs> people come in, hi guys. And and you know, we are I'm honest, I, I use this phrase some sometimes and I work for a diversity and inclusion startup. <laughs> so I think it's just, you know, recognizing that some of these language that we use in our day-to-day -day life, you know, we may not intentionally um, you know, want to, you know, be offensive or or you know, have that kind of bias in, in how we speak, but it's just so ingrained in, in our language. So it's, it's again, it's about, you know, when you see yourself or you recognize yourself using some of these terms, it's about, you know, taking a step back, acknowledging it and, and you know, thinking about, you know, your language is, is very critical when it comes to the diversity and inclusion conversation. So which we'll go into at now. So, um, so, and, and we wanted to highlight, you know, this because we are in, in such a, a, a space where, you know, this diversity inclusion conversation, it's so big, but we find that 
a lot of people are fearful of, of you know, being part of this conversation with the, because they're fearful of saying the wrong things a lot of times. So people tend to not want to, you know, engage in, in conversations. And so we wanted to just maybe call out a few things that, um, you know, some specific do's and don'ts. So when it comes to age, you know, yes, it's okay to, you know, describe um, you know, age if it's relevant. So I mean, particularly if it's our own initiative, you know, I'm running a, a session, it's for ages, you know, 12 to 18, you know, that's relevant. But when it comes to age, you know, what we say is if it's not relevant, you know, if, if, if it's, if it doesn't need to be known, don't, don't use it. And similarly with, you know, disability. So we try to, you know, in terms of when you are talking about disability or engaging in that conversation, it's about focusing on the abilities rather than limitations. So, and and more importantly, not only defining a person according to their disabilities or condition, this could also kind of fall within mental health. So that labeling piece, um, that, that's where it becomes tricky when you're having conversations around kind of disability. Uh, mental health. You know, we've just come out of this pandemic or just coming out of this pandemic and we know that mental health is skyrocketed and it's such a big conversation for us right now. So it's about when you are talking about this, using person-centered languages or language to really reflect that sensitivity is, is so key um, in this regard and, and not, again, describing people as mentally ill or defined by a condition very similar to the disability piece. Um, and we, all, we often get questions around, you know, when it comes to race and ethnicity, you know, how do I engage as in that conversation, potentially as, as a non-person of color? Because some, to mm. be honest, people, you know, think it's awkward or, or how do I describe someone without offending them? So it's sometimes difficult to know what words you can use. So what we say is if it's relevant, and if it's important to use race or ethnicity, then yes, you should. Um, otherwise, you know, refrain from using that. So, of course, you know, things are using a racial or ethnic slurs. That that's a given. I hope it's a given for a lot of people um, in this case. So, if these are typically, you know, words or you know, um, statements that relay um, stereotypes based on you know eth ethnic or racial association. So. Um, so I'm seeing some comments here. Who kind of um, it's challenging to remove labels when so many in society believe labeling will help support or get to know will help. Um, yeah, will help to support or get to know someone. Yeah, absolutely, and mm. and it's a great point. It's and and a lot of the time it's it's understanding. Yes, labels help us um, understand who we are and in relation to others. And it's important in society to have labels. We we need them. Um, but it's understanding also going back to if an individual has a preference of how they'd like to be you know termed or or you know, referred to. It's about understanding what an individual's preference is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and letting, letting them let you know what that label is. I think it's moving away from that assumption um, and asking. I think the first step is asking. And yes. also, I think I saw it in the chat, which is this is learnt and unlearned behaviour. So yes. correct. We've been told to think this way. And, I mean, look at where we are in the world. It hasn't worked that great. <laughs> um, so we're now trying to um, unlearn that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Um, so when it comes to you know, sex, gender, identity, so we know at the at the moment it's about using gender neutral terms, and we've just gave the example earlier around it, policemen and 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 that's you know, gendered language. It's about you know not referring to roles as gender defined where possible, so chair, um, and and using those kind of gender neutral terms that don't make a, a sex distinction. So parent guardian as opposed to mother or father when it comes to sexual orientation this is where you know you just spoke about it. it's about asking an individual you know what is their preferred terms and you know a lot of you may see on linkedin now there's the option to add your pronouns and that's something that we are um, a lot of you know in society we are trying to do more of to really acknowledge individuals that may not identify as one gender and 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 so it's um, providing kind of that space safe space so it's, again it's around when it comes to sexuality unless it's relevant um, to the context you know, don't mention it um, and finally we know that it's very similar to the other elements 
if a person's religion, you know, is not relevant to the information you're communicating, you know, don't refer to it. Um, but more importantly, it's, it's not assuming someone's religion based on their ethnicity, you know, country origin, you know, or name. Yeah, but I think with religion as well, it's it's kind of um, also uh, acknowledging it. Um, mm-hmm. I think, you know, just pretending it's not there. Um, I think it's acknowledging it through, um, you know, celebrations. If they have already acknowledged that today's a celebration for um, the religion that I practice, mm-hmm. you know, there's nothing wrong with going, oh, no, that's great. Um, how do I say this? Um, mm-hmm. And it's just a conversation, right? Yes. Um, and if your intent and heart is in the right place um, and you're just welcoming of um, understanding and, and knowing people are different, um, it doesn't have to be awkward. No. Yeah. Doesn't. And we encourage you to, you know, have conversations. You know, I've, I've been in you know, situations where, you know, I've, I've said the wrong thing or you know I was recently in a supermarket and there was someone that I you know um, didn't have was blind and then I, I just noticed the way I was speaking to them you know was wasn't appropriate so I guess and I had kind of take had take a step back and and you know think about okay why why are you talking differently or why are you you know why are you kind of slowing down in, in how you're speaking to this person they can hear you right yeah yeah mm. so I get, and and that's me being vulnerable in this group it's about you know, the more we can just be honest with, with each other we're gonna make mistakes we're gonna mess up we may potentially offend people but I think it's to your point Betty it's about you know if we have it's acknowledging it you know being respectful and, and coming out of a place of respect that's yeah. ultimately the the key message here so don't be afraid to um yeah yeah make mistakes yeah. it's because it's going to happen and don't beat yourself up about it yeah this is essentially a high level um uh, uh summary of how you develop a consciously inclusive workplace action plan or what you need to consider when developing an action plan so we've got here for senior leadership managers um we there's about eight steps there but essentially it is about um starting with an evidence-based approach every uh age care, every uh, facility is different. So it's about where, for you, what matters? Where are you overrepresented? Where are you underrepresented? Mm. So do you have too many people who are all from the same, you know, um, age experience? There's so many layers, the intersectional ones, but also, um, you know, um, there's so many layers to look at. But understanding what is the tailored evidence-based approach for you? Mm. Wh- who's missing? Who's not there? Who needs to be there to... Uh, bring the diversity of thought then you are able to tailor that specifically to your own goals um, and then communicate the commitment and goals to all staff very important mm-hmm. your staff need to know it because guess what your staff are diverse and they need to know what your commitment is um, as an organization and also to your clients um, embedding diversity inclusion into business as usual make it don't make it a subject mm-hmm. where people are like oh here comes a dni <laughs> Make it a part of everything that you do. Mm -hmm. Um, The way you do uh, your meetings, everything, your BAU, your business as usual. Um, Champion inclusive leadership. When somebody's doing inclusion and diversity right, as a leader, you need to champion that. Um, I think even putting it in, people have put it into the performance conversations. It's just a part of how you do things and part of all your processes. Track and monitor progress against goals continue to track, are we doing well, where we're not, don't just let it fall out when another priority comes in. And it's a lot easier to do that when it's a part of your DNA. Um, Celebrate and reward those role modeling, inclusive behavior and continue learning and growing because that's what it's all about as a leader and sharing that and being honest. Direct care workers who are working with diverse clients, um, it's really important that you seek to understand individuals' needs because they're all different and we're never making assumptions. Person-centered approach. Look at me, I could work as an agent. I could, you guys need to hire me. <laughs> uh, seek to continue learning, celebrate the diverse cultures and backgrounds of your team and their lived experience. Utilize various resources, support. There's so many. Um, we know uh, in speaking to Lisa, there's so many resources to you. It's go back to them um, and try to practice them as much as you can. Provide feedback on DNI initiatives. Be a part of it. Mm-hmm. Go to your manager and say, this is where we're not. You, you are the front facing. Don't ever forget how important your role is as a direct care worker. Um, provide feedback. Oh, yeah, I've covered that. Um, and seek to understand differences through respect. I think that's a great way to end. Um, And I think really sums up what it's about when it comes to conscious inclusion. 
So closing remarks, be aware that biases and privileges exist. Never make assumptions. Instead, seek to learn about others and their intersectional experiences. Very important in the aged care sector. And watch your language, but don't be afraid to make mistakes because we're all human at the end of the day. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I know that was probably more than three minutes, but I can read quickly. Uh, <laughs> so one more thing, I'll let Laura. Yes, one more thing. You know, thank you everyone for your time today. So I think, guess now you've had this, you've had this presentation, we've had this conversation today, but now the, the most important part is about, you know, what are you going to do differently? Because unless we each individually take actions and, and do something differently, nothing changes. So when I put this question out there today, you know, if there's one thing that you will take away from today, whether it's about your language, whether it's about, um, you know, to thinking about how you can be conscious of inclusion, but to really commit to one thing that you can do and, and that, um, you know, the workplace action is probably a good place to start and can make you stuck. But yeah, think about one thing that you will commit to today to be consciously inclusive. Thank you, everyone. I'll pass it over to Lisa. <laughs> Thank you so much, Betty and Lorna, for that presentation. Um, I've just been, my mind's just going, pew, 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 pew. there's all these things coming up. <laughs> um, so for me, that sort of demonstrates that um, you've moved my brain. Um, and that's really, really great. And hopefully the audience have started to think about this really complex um, but important topic um, around self-awareness as a tool for culturally appropriate care and, um, you know, how do we actually then, by being self-aware and being under and understand how we um, have unconscious bias or um, discriminations in, in the way that we think, that, that then how does that impact on, obviously, older people that we care for? Um, and so, so thank you so much. There's obviously a mixture of the, the real theoretical understanding of um, unconscious bias and then obviously what to do. You know, how can organisations move towards conscious inclusion? So I just want to say thank you so much for your expertise. By the way, Betty and Laura are in London at the moment and it's 5 a.m. <laughs> so um, let's, let's just applaud that for the commitment um, to diversity and inclusion. We've got some claps there. Um, so thank you so much again. And um, now it's your opportunity to sort of maybe put in some, some, some reflections or some um, questions that you might have. And... and just wanted to 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 acknowledge the um, the stories that have already been placed in the chat, and just to really um, to say thank you for doing that because it's about you know sharing your story, and we don't know each other, and you know we're all here together, but we are you know we're sort of probably you know we met for the first time, for example, and you have shared some of your um, your backgrounds or you know your upbringings. I just wanted to acknowledge that and just say thank you. Um, there was some some reflections around, you know, what are some of the things, you know, some of the values that we're raised amongst. And, and I sort of had a reflection around, you know, the fact that I, there was a photo of me in kindergarten. I'm holding a book about the royal family, the British royal family, and I was four years old. But, you know, that doesn't reflect me, does it? So it was all about how we have these systemic biases as well um, and, how the, and how systems can perhaps have a narrative um, that doesn't always reflect everyone's story in Australia. And when we work with older people, their story is not necessarily represented in public spaces. And, and that can lead to marginalisation. Um, it can also lead to um, discrimination. And, you know, we had on the news the other day, you know, a Jewish, a Jewish person be violently attacked. Um, so, you know, we're talking about different levels of, of the way that being unconsciously biased can impact the wider community. And so it's a really, really good topic um, and I just want to say thank you again for for um, your contributions. Um, now, do we have any questions for um, Betty or Lorna? Um, yeah, so we've got more reflections rather than questions around sort of um, things that we can do in the workplace, like ask what occasions that people or significant days that people celebrate rather than assuming that they celebrate Christmas. Um, and that can happen a lot in the workplace around sort of giving people Easter eggs and um, Christmas things, uh, which is that way of sort of assuming that everyone comes from a Christian framework. And that's something that we um, advocate here at the centre to promote spiritual and faith diversity. Um, but that, that's definitely something that I've come across in a lot of workplaces is the assumption that everyone celebrates Christmas. Um, 
being mindful of the language we use, absolutely. So that sort of relates to, you know, the whole idea of um, this, this kind of things that just come out of our mouths um, that we don't really, it's automatic. Um, no more questions, that's great. Um, and I just wanted to reflect on this whole idea of, you know, and I just said to Betty and Lorna, good luck. I mean, good luck. You know, you just say good luck. But luck is um, something that's a concept in many faith traditions. <laughs> if you wanted to go deep into the concept of luck, um, or even when you say bless you and someone sneezes, it's not bless you in every in every faith framework, just whatever. Okay, um, so Dory Kelly has a question. Um, sorry, George. Um, what would you recommend for finding out what the most common assumptions and biases are so that we can work towards these with our teams. Example, the Christmas example that um, I've just used, thank you. Um, and a list of common assumptions. Um, so, yes, that's a really good question. Um, so Betty and Lord, I might bring it back to you. What are some of the common assumptions? I think you did touch upon um, some of them but is there anything that's come up in your work around some of the common assumptions yeah i mean i think it depends on the context right mm -hmm. um i think uh, we've seen quite a, a bit of it come up uh today in the comments when it comes to the aged care sector in particular i think there's a lot of kind of um ageism and uh bias around uh you know where the competency of um uh people who are a little older so you know assuming that they haven't had this great life and now they're at this point at this stage of their life and um you know forgetting about all the amazing experiences that they've had and seeing them as they present at that point i think is the most relevant for aged care but mm. for us you know there's a lot of assumptions depending on um, the corporate world has a lot of assumptions of you know, coming in and people not assuming that you are the manager or you are the person who is running the meeting mm -hmm. um, and speaking directly to your manager uh, or assuming that actually you may not know what's going on um, just because you haven't said anything in the meeting. Um, and people kind of, you know, acknowledging that you're there, but also not acknowledging um, uh, the value that you bring. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of those. Anything to add, mm. Lorna? Yeah, I think that the best way to, I mean, there's, there'll be a lot of resources online, but I think the best way to really have these types of conversations and, and understand, you know, what those um, assumptions are, and have conversations with people that are different to you. And that you, you learn so much through that by just simply having a conversation. I think that would be kind of my mm. kind of tip around understanding that. And, and, and the more we can find people that, that are open and, and can create a safe space where nothing said is, is wrong, I think that would really help. Um, yeah, scenario. definitely. Mm -hmm. There's been some really great comments. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there seems to be a lot of consciously inclusive people in the room, which we love. Mm -hmm. um, so keep it up, keep learning and unlearning. Um, and we also wanted to share that uh, a bit of what we do at DIFTAL is recognizing that it's an education, it's a journey. And that's what we do when we work with our employers. We have our platform, which is um, for candidates who are struggling to find work specifically in the corporate space. So we target head offices and that's purposeful because we've done the evidence-based um, research, which is in the plan, <laughs> if you go back. But we recognize that um, you know, diverse, peop uh, diverse people from cold backgrounds are um, very much uh, underrepresented in head offices where the decisions are made and they tend to be client facing. Mm -hmm. um, and we think that that needs to change, um, especially because they have a wealth of knowledge, so much resilience, and then they're the ones who could potentially be in those leadership positions. So we're very passionate about that. And that's why we created um, DIFTAL and recognizing that. Um, and we uh, created the platform to allow organizations to put up their roles um, and because a lot of them essentially said, we can't find the talent. It's not there. Um, and that's wrong. <laughs> you know, the talent is there, but they're getting lost through um, bias in the recruitment processes. Um, and that's why we've got our platform to allow employers who want to be purposeful about looking for that diverse talent mm -hmm. on our DIFTAL platform. But we also work with them um, through uh, 
training like this. So uh, inclusive um, recruitment training, conscious inclusion training um, as well. So if we you you have if you want to dive a little bit deep, deeper, feel free to contact us. If you didn't notice, that was a quick plug on Dictal. <laughs> 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 No, no, that's that's what we're here for, um, to promote um, diversity experts and subject matter experts like yourself and leaders in this space and the confluence between diversity experts and the aged care sector. And we know that the aged care sector definitely needs a lot more voices. So um, um, feel free to reach out to us if you wanted to um, collaborate with Diptal uh, moving forward. So thank you so much again for that. Um, we've got more comments coming into the chat um, around some of the other things that have come up in people's lives and some reflections such as gender roles that and also um, gender roles and um, was there yeah. a question uh, about mother, how mother, do you, rec how do you yeah. recommend yeah yeah so 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 basically um, and just the comment on mother's day and father's day which is a really good one thank you for that um, the, the question was around what, how do you deal with discriminations that come up from the residents? <laughs> and um, this has come up quite a few times from, from older people who, who kind of, you know, they're, they're in a vulnerable position and they want to kind of feel safe and they want to feel that, that they can sort of, um, you know, um, communicate uh, freely. And, they, and they've got certain biases in working with people from certain cultural backgrounds or... Um, you know, it could have been from their past background. Like we had a story recently of a, of, a, of an older person from a Christian background who didn't want to work with a worker from a Muslim um, background. And um, and so we were unpacking this story of like how to actually address this. Um, and so it, is, it isn't just like, a you know, an easy solution, is it? Because it's really, if we're looking at person-centred care, it's about how the older person can feel safe. Um but at the same time, it, they're, they're in a setting where, um, you know, discrimination is illegal under the Aged Care Act, and that includes all workers um, to not be discriminated against. So it's it's a, it's an interesting topic. I don't think we have the solution right now, but, I mean, it's about sort of unpacking the reasons why that older person might want to choose a certain person from a certain faith um, and reiterating the fact that all workers are trained to deliver culturally appropriate care, that they're, that they're safe, you know, reassuring the older person that he, he or she, or if they're non-binary or identify with any kind of um, gender, that they are safe and that um, that if they ever feel unsafe with a worker, that they're able to complain. Um, because it's not about matching people based on faith or culture. Um, if we start doing that, that's um, really not what's the... Um, the whole idea of the Aged Care Act is about or, or, the, or, or the quality standards. It's about how the person feels. Um, and in saying that, of course, they can sort of ask for their language preferences because they do have a right to an interpreter or translated resources. So, of course, you know, the government does advocate for um, the reduction of language barriers. But when it comes to, you know, them choosing a certain culture or faith, that's sort of around what, what are their intentions to do so. Um, and then perhaps linking them to somewhere where they might want to go. So linking them to certain faith um, leaders or cultural groups. But in terms of the personal care worker themselves, they're going to be working with lots of different people and it's understanding why they might have those discriminations. Um, similarly, what came up was um, around accents. And so if someone has a cognitive you know, um, impairment, you know, dementia or a disability, um, then it's hard for them to understand some of the accents. So that's a really tricky case scenario there as well. So welcome any reflections around that um, as moving forward. And we also had someone reach out to kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, if you wanted to continue this conversation, we can um, sort of, you know, encourage you to exchange your your sort of details and stuff like that and or, or reach out to us and we can link you up because it's really important that we stay connected. Um yeah, we had a, another comment about accents. So that's been an interesting one as well. Um, all right, just one final question, and then we'll go over to uh, Nikki, who's going to talk about further support from, that we can offer from the centre. Um, and this is from Kai. Uh, we talked about how to be aware of unconscious bias and how to be more inclusive. But how 
but can you give some tips or advice on how to handle something when a bias is directed towards you? So when you get a personal, when you feel that a bias is towards you personally, um, how do you react to it? Um, so Kyla's mentioned that she does come from a culturally and linguistically diverse background um, and she doesn't know how to handle such comments. Thanks so much, Kai. So over to you, Betty and Lorna. So how to deal with microaggressions or, or biases that might come up? Yeah, and I think it, it's always a very you know, challenging situation to be in, and I, I really kind of relate and understand kind of your position. It's not, it's not great, and I think sometimes people are aware of, of what they're saying. Going back to the point around prejudice or assumptions or stereotypes, but many times when it comes to those microaggressions, they someone might say something to you, you know, without really knowing that it's offensive, and, and it may not be tension intentional or malicious um, in terms of them saying something to you. So I would encourage you, if you are in a situation where something has been said or directed towards you that's made you feel uncomfortable, you know, call it out and and say, you know, hey, you said this, this is what it this is how I hear it. This is how this is this is how it's making me feel. Um, this is what it really means to me because, you know, going back to the question, it might be a very harmless question around, you know, where are you from or where are you really from? But to go back and say, actually, when you asked me that question the second time when I told you I'm Australian, what that what that is inferring is that I'm not truly Australian and this is this is what it makes me feel. So don't be afraid to to have an, you know, open honest conversation and and use that as a learning opportunity, you know, both and, and I guess an opportunity to teach someone, um, you know, uh, uh, your perspective and your view. So it's not always easy or, or, or you know, the most straightforward process. But, yeah, the yeah. more we can have these honest, you know, interactions with each other, that's how we learn. That's how we continue to grow, grow as individuals. Yeah. And the only thing I have to add is, so there's that when you communicate to somebody, your what you've done actually has made you feel this way. And they continue and it becomes a constant thing where it actually can have room for allegation of discrimination. You as an employee have the right to be able to voice if you are feeling, feeling unsafe or you feel victimized. Remember, those systems are there for you to also use as somebody with that, um, with that right to go to HR understand what your rights are and you shouldn't be you shouldn't be in an environment where you always have to um uh, deal with that so understand the difference sometimes between okay is this something i can communicate is it changing am i now feeling uncomfortable am i coming into a space it's either you can be removed from that space but or or um or it may even be um uh, you know dispute um, that needs to be resolved. Mm -hmm. As a HR person, I feel like sometimes as called people, we don't understand um, or have the, you know, we tend to be grateful is the word, which I hate. I've had somebody say to me before, aren't you grateful to be here? And I was like, uh, what are you talking about? Are you grateful to be here? Um, but yeah, it, it, it's essentially um, understanding that we have employee rights and if anything, we tend to not voice it as much because this whole assumption of you have a job, you know, you're a migrant, like you, you, you know, like this is the minimum of what you can get. Don't complain tends to be put. We have this mindset, but we actually have access to everything else. Everybody has access to. I think it's usually our internal voice that says, Oh no, no one will hear me, but I really encourage you if you're ever in a situation, you are feeling unsafe or um, this isn't actually a dispute. Use, the processes, go to HR, understand your rights and make the, the decisions there um, that are required. Yeah. And that comes from my equal opportunity, human rights, <laughs> don't <laughs> HR hat that I'm like, not nah, follow the processes. Um, and you'd find that a lot of cold people are not following, pro are, are not the ones putting in cases. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I can see a very good point um, in the in the chat. So from Lynette, Lynette, so the role of allies can be so important when you are facing discrimination. Absolutely reiterate that. Find people around you that also you know don't agree with what's happening and, and seek their help. So absolutely the role of allies is very critical in, in these scenarios. Yeah. And everyone has a voice. So if you can see somebody's being treated differently and you just are quiet. Um, 
you're not, I think it's the difference between being uh, anti-racism and racism by you not saying anything. I know this is a really mm. confronting thing is to, you're actually a part of it. Mm. <laughs> um, although you never said it um, by you watching it and just going, that's not right, but nothing to do with me. You are not essentially um, a part of it, but you are condoning it in its own way. But obviously do say something in the safe space. It's either you acknowledge it with the person to say how you were treated is wrong. Mm-hmm. How can I support with that? Mm-hmm. Um, it's not necessarily getting involved. Um, is always the right thing because we don't want it to, you know, <laughs> go to mm-hmm. somewhere else. But it is acknowledging it, whether you're acknowledging it to the side, you're acknowledging it, um, you know, in, in a different way, but you have to acknowledge it. And that is what makes you a real ally. Wonderful. That's really, really good points there. Thank you so much in uh, in really empowering people to sort of not feel like they've got nothing to do, not you know, that, that they've got nowhere to go or nothing to do in relation to being experiencing discrimination. And the same applies with um, with older people um, who are in residential care or home care settings or accessing aged care services, that they do have the right to complain as well. Um, we can't answer all the questions because we're already running to left almost running out of time. Um, So I'm going to just say thank you to everyone and um, we have received your questions and reflections. Um, Let us know if you want to continue the conversation about this topic. We do run a communities of practice where we can share stories. So maybe we can have this topic next time and and continue the conversations. Um, We're going to uh, say thank you to Betty and Lorna um, again, Um, but stay, stay on the line because we're going to pass it over now to um, to Nikki, uh, Nicholas Wittinghausen, who is a Senior Advisor and Senior Project Officer here at the Centre for Cultural Diversity and Ageing. Um, he's going to talk about where to go for further support um, around culturally appropriate care. So thank you, Nikki. Thanks very much, Lisa. I really, we had a very interactive session that's, that shows you know, how, how hot and interesting and relevant the topic is. So thanks, everyone. Yeah, so um, in terms of our website and where you can go for support, we have a number of tabs there. These are the key ones. It's the multilingual resources. One of our, we have very popular multilingual communication cards. And that tab to find, we have our good practice stories, what aged care providers are doing to promote culturally inclusive care. One of our key resources are inclusive service standards. We have a number of resources in the, under that tab where you can find more about the inclusive service and the practice guides as well, which help you to design um, inclusive services. Um, training and professional development under the tab, you will be able to find Lorna and Betty's um, presentation under the 2022 training and also our register for bilingual um, workers. So if we go to the next slide, these are our practice guides. One of our recent one is 10 steps in developing a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan, HK, which is very popular, which we launched at one of our previous um, webinars. Culture inclusive feedback, obviously a very important topic and effective core design with consumers from culture and linguistically diverse backgrounds. One is also very popular in food and nutrition. And um, we also are updating some of them at, at the moment. If you would like to um, promote the work we're doing and maybe put in your um, your facilities to access um, any PCACs, uh, any PCAC organizations around Australia or um, the resources that we can offer, this is a poster. We, we encourage you, if you wish, to promote and to put in your um, offices and then people can access our information and and make use of the training or any available resources we, we have. So we, that, that you want to share with everyone. So that's great. And the last one for this financial year, the last um, webinar that's coming up is Managing Equal and Mutually Beneficial Partnership with Multicultural Communities, which we're looking forward to. If you haven't registered, it's also on our training tab. You can still register for it. And it will be the last one for this financial year. And then um, we are part of the Partners in Culture Appropriate Care Program. We are funded through the Department of Health, what Biliana mentioned earlier. And um, the center is part of a PICAC alliance, which is the national body comprising PICAC funded organizations across Australia. And there's a PICAC organization in each state and territory. And we really aim to be a voice in discussion, conduit into information, training and resource to inform aged and community care service providers. And I just want to mention at the end, um, a project that we are helping to um, facilitate, which is, um, was funded by the Department of Health and an ICON agency. It's really as part of the HK Royal Commission recommendation was to ensure diversity is core business across aged care. 
and increase access to translation and interpreting service in HK is funded by the Department of Health. It's really about enhancing the ability of um, senior Australian sex information through trying to target a provision of translating and interpreting service. If you would like any information to be translated, it's relevant that you have at the moment that you're using free. for free. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa, for doing that. It's really important that people are really interested when it's for free because already um, limited resources. So you can um, just send an email to diversity at hk at iconagency.com.au and state, you know, which resources you have and which you want to um, translate. So please make use of that great project. So yeah, really thank you for everyone. And I hand um, back over to Biliana. Thanks everyone. Thanks, um, Nikki. And uh, thank you for participating today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the session. And uh, Feel free to visit our website, culturaldiversity.com.au. Uh, go to our um, YouTube page and uh, also visit us on Facebook and LinkedIn. And a special thank you for uh, Sarah, who is our digital uh, producer from Red Hat Films. And again, thanks to uh, Betty and Lorna for a wonderful presentation today um, and for all your feedback and uh, hope to see you on our next webinar thank you guys bye bye